We're going to talk this morning about those seasons when it's particularly hard to sing those words. Don't stop dancing. Don't stop dreaming. Joy comes in the morning. Really? How many mornings does it take? We're going to talk this morning about God's relentless pursuit of the disappointed. Turning your Bibles to Jonah chapter 4. We're concluding uh, a series in a book that I just love. It's only 48 verses. I mean, we could memorize this book. 48 verses, yet in 48 verses, there's actually two storylines. The one storyline, of course, is about Nineveh. Nineveh is where current day Mosul, uh, Iraq, is. It's about uh, 600 miles from Jerusalem, and uh, it was the arch enemy of Israel, especially the the northern ten tribes of uh, Israel that was, the capital was Samaria. And Jonah was from the northern ten tribes, and he was called by God to travel 600 miles to go and preach grace to Israel's arch enemy. He didn't want to do that, was you? He was disappointed that God called him to do that. So he ran away, and God had ways of bringing him back. God relentlessly pursued Jonah. Again, the theme of the book overall is God's relentless pursuit of our hearts. And then Jonah went and preached, and sure enough, Nineveh repented. And Jonah was incredibly displeased. He was incredibly disappointed. Why? Because Jonah's thinking, what if these yo-yos, after about 50 years, backslide and end up cruelly attacking and destroying the northern tribes of Israel? By the way, he wasn't crazy. He didn't know it, but it actually happened. Exactly what Jonah feared happened. And Jonah, even not knowing it was going to happen, feared it was going to happen, and was disappointed when Nineveh repented. The second storyline is about Jonah himself, the runaway prophet. In a sense, though Jonah's historical, it parallels Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal sons. Nineveh is the younger son. They, they run away from God. They want no part of him. And, and they, they squander all of God's gifts in violent, immoral living. But they come home. They repent when they're offered grace. Jonah parallels the older son, the son who never leaves, the dutiful son, the religious son, the self-righteous son. And the parable ends in Luke 15 with the father pleading with the older son to not be so disappointed at the grace shown his younger brother and to come in and join the party. And Luke 15 ends without us knowing what the older son does. And Jonah ends without us knowing what Jonah does. God asks Jonah a group of questions, trying to teach Jonah grace and compassion that he knows in his head, but he doesn't comprehend in his heart. This is a prophet of God. Jonah, the book, ends with Jonah sitting in disappointment. How are you sitting this morning? If we were really honest, how many of us are sitting in disappointment? Can I be honest? I'm standing in disappointment right now. I'm going to share so that 
you all know when you see me, we can say, oh, you too? What I'm about to share, I'm not sharing to get your pity. And you need to know I'm not even whining. I just want you to know how I've been wrestling with disappointment. Many of you already know the first part I'm going to talk about. On March 25th, Lori and I got slammed by the tornado, destroyed our property. Our house is still standing, thankfully. But Lori and I bought that property because we're reverse Green Acres. I'm the city boy. She's the country girl. She always wanted to live in the country, so we bought this property four acres surrounded by trees and we're a mile and a half from the church and we felt like we were a hundred miles away like being in the country nothing around us that's gone you can see our house from anywhere now and we can see everything around us that may seem like not a big deal but it's disappointing what's also disappointing is 12 months ago we spent thousands of dollars on landscaping it's gone that's disappointing if you come by our house it still looks like a lumber yard 80 to 100 logs 10 to 12 feet long, brush piled up 12 feet high all along both sides of the road. And every morning I drive past it and every night I come back and all the other streets around us are clear. Ours isn't. That's disappointing. Our cars got nailed by the debris. So I try to plan. I call uh, body shops. I get an appointment. I set up a rental car reservation. I drop off my car. I go to the rental place only to hear Mr. Flayhart, we have no cars in all of Birmingham. I said, no, wait a minute. What does reservation mean to you? <laughs> and I'm so glad that nobody from our church was around. <clears throat> I have spent countless hours over the past three and a half weeks with insurance companies, with contractors, with tree removal, with tree cutting, and with body shops. On Friday, while I'm working on the sermon, I receive a fraud alert. Someone in Georgia has punched in the numbers of one of my credit cards. They didn't even use a credit card because I had lost it. They punched in the numbers. Now I've got to spend an hour and a half with the credit card company working all that through. And then yesterday... Yesterday, I received in a mail a debit card, and it said, A.L. Vantage. And I'm, what is A.L. Vantage? I've never seen this in my life. I didn't apply for this. Well, I read the letter. <laughs> it's a debit card from the government for unemployment. D do y'all know something I don't know about? Like, are my days numbered here? Some joker has used my uh, social security number to actually file unemployment with the government. And now I've got to make all kinds of phone calls to Montgomery. I've got to show them that I'm actually employed and I have no idea what to do with this debit card. Then yesterday, my sweet bride who works... You all have no idea how hard she works. 
She, she, she would never say this. She has become known as one of uh, the highest rated English golden retriever breeders in the southeast. People come from all over the nation to get her dogs. Her dog goes into labor yesterday and immediately everything falls apart. The dog's in hard labor for three hours and nothing is happening. It's getting intense. They have to go to the emergency vet clinic. Three of the dogs are breech. In other words, they are they are just all jammed up inside of this dog. The dog's life could be in danger. The puppy's lives definitely are in danger. Two of the pups are born dead. The rest of them, thankfully, and the dog are fine. Now, you may be thinking, okay, Bob, first world problems. I agree. I completely agree. First world problems. And you all may be going through things much more difficult than this. But after a while, it's like situation after situation after situation. And I'm like, really, God? This is pretty disappointing. I have dear, dear friends, some of whom just have discovered they have cancer. That's disappointing. I have other dear friends whose parents are aging and they're ill and they're suffering and we've been praying for God just to take them home. And he's not. And there's just more prolonged pain and suffering. Really, God? That's disappointing. Some of us are in really hard marriages. Harder than we ever dreamed it would be, and that's disappointing. Some of us are single, and it's more difficult than we ever dreamed. And that's disappointing. Tim Keller, the pastor in New York City for many, many years, just retired from Redeemer Presbyterian Church. They were going to start new kinds of ministries. They were going to be engaged with their children and grandchildren. They were looking forward to all kinds of years of just new stuff for a change. And he's got pancreatic cancer. And his days are really numbered. His faith is strong, but he shared in, in the magazine, The Atlantic. This is disappointing. This is not what we expect. Philip Yancey, in his book, Disappointment with God, says that's exactly why we get disappointed as Christians. Because what we expect or what we anticipate from the Christian life is often so different than what we actually experience. And Yancey says, though nobody likes to talk about it, everybody in the church has experienced deep disappointment with God. So what do we do with it? Well, we have a first-hand account of how God pursues relentlessly the disappointed. So if you're disappointed with the Christian life, if you're disappointed with God, then you have come to the right place today. Let's all stand out of reverence for God's Word. <clears throat> Follow along as I read Jonah. I'm going to actually read the last verse of chapter 3 and then all of chapter 4. This is God's Word. When God saw what they did, and again, the Ninevites repented when Jonah finally went and preached, which is what is exactly Jonah was afraid they'd do. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Even more than fearing Nineveh's repentance, Jonah was afraid, God, I know you. You're merciful. You're liable to do something like this. 
Sure enough, look at verse 1 of chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. In other words, he was really disappointed. And he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Now you'd think that would be good news. Not for Jonah. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? In other words, is is this really going to do you any good? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat, it, he sat under it in the shade. Now we'll find out in verse 6 that shade that God provided for him till he should see what would become of the city. Now, explaining verse 5, the Lord God had appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. In other words, nothing like the eternal souls of people. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? The end. It's wild. May God bless the hearing and teaching of His inspired, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative Word. This is God's Word. He gave it to us because He loves us. And he wants us to know that even when we wrestle with disappointment, he is still pursuing us. Let's pray. Father, help us to be honest where we're sitting this morning. Help us to not play games with you, but help us to be real and authentic. Lead us through this passage now in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So we're going to look at three inviting characteristics of the heart of God that satisfies the disappointed. Three inviting characteristics of the heart of God that satisfies the disappointed. Those inviting characteristics are His pity, His presence, and His providence. His pity, His presence, and His providence. So, First of all, bring your disappointment to God's pity. Now, I opened the message by telling you I was going to share my disappointment and that I didn't want a pity party. That's not why I was sharing it. And it's sad that when we hear the word pity, we almost always associate it with a negative connotation, like someone's throwing a pity party or we we talk about it in terms of Showing pity for somebody that's pathetic. Someone that's filled with self-pity. Someone that's playing the victim. But you need to know the Hebrew word is actually very positive, very tender, and very inviting. The Hebrew word for pity that God uses in verse 11, should I not pity Nineveh? The word means to take compassionate action with tears streaming down your cheeks. That's what pity is. Taking compassionate action with tears streaming down your cheeks. By the way, can I just tell you that Laurie and I have experienced this from God 
through you. An hour after the tornado, a number of you showed up with chainsaws. And when some of you arrived as you got out of your truck, you greeted me with tears down your face. And you said, I had no idea. You were slammed. And then many of you have shown up at our front door with meals. Thank you so much. And Lauren, I've been amazed at how many times from pulling up our street, pulling into our driveway, and walking to the front door, by the time you got there, there were tears streaming down your cheeks. And you said, the pictures don't show a fraction of this. This is devastating. And you reflected God's heart of pity to us with those tears streaming down your cheeks. The Hebrew word for pity means kindly sorrow evoked by the suffering, distress, or misfortune of someone else. Leading the person to give relief or aid or help or to show mercy. Pity fills the heart of God. If you're disappointed, if you're pained, if you're angry, if you're frustrated, God's heart toward you is moved to pity. You think, well, you don't know what I'm thinking. No, I don't, but I see what Jonah's thinking. There, there's nothing godly here about Jonah. Not one element of Christ-likeness. And yet God is filled with pity, not only toward Nineveh, but toward Jonah as well. And through the entire chapter, God shows Jonah pity. God's heart is filled with pity, and Jonah's heart was completely devoid of it. He's angry that God pitied Nineveh. He's too wrapped up in the nationalism of the whole thing. And so God says, okay, I'll change up what I'm doing so you can maybe learn some pity. He took, he took the focus off of Nineveh, and he appointed a plant. And the plant grew overnight and provided shade for Jonah in the midst of his frustration, the heat of his heart internally and the heat of the sun externally. And then God appointed a worm that ate the tree. And Jonah is disappointed again because he pitied the tree. God's like, okay, <laughs> you're starting to get it here, Jonah. You pity the tree that you didn't plant. You pity the tree that you didn't tend. You pity a tree that was here today and gone tomorrow. Now, should I not then pity people who are eternal? Should I not pity people that I have made and people that I tend to on the entire globe? And oh, by the way, Jonah, I made the cattle, and I pity them too. Talked about my first world problems. Two puppies. What are they? God pities the pups. If God pities the cattle... He pities the pups. But if God pities the pups and he pities cruel, wicked, idolatrous Nineveh, how much more as a child of God can you hope and trust and rejoice in the reality that God pities you? That his heart is moved with kindly sorrow when he knows your disappointment. Now, he may not even agree with our disappointment. He didn't agree with Jonah's disappointment. 
but he was still filled with pity. It's God's nature. Now notice that Jonah in verse 2 can spout off God's nature. Well, I knew you were merciful. I knew you were slow to anger. I knew you were abounding in steadfast love. Yeah, he seems to know that in his head. He doesn't seem to believe any of it. How about you? First of all, God teaches Jonah and us pity so that we would show pity to others. Like Ninevites, like people over the fence, over the mountain, over the pew, overseas. But then God shows pity through the book of Jonah so that we might learn in Christ how God pities us in all of our disappointment. Bring your disappointment to God's pity. Secondly, bring your disappointment to God's presence. Okay, these are going to be some hard words to process here. So I'll begin with this. God in his infinite love for you and me cares a lot more about developing intimacy in our hearts for him than he cares or is concerned about the immediate relief of our disappointment. Say it again. God's love for you and me is so great that he is much more interested in using disappointment to develop deeper intimacy with him than he is in immediately relieving our disappointment. You see, one of the purposes of God-ordaining circumstances that bubble up our disappointment is that we might be drawn into God's presence. And in God's presence is where we're transformed. Look at verse 2. The disappointment of Jonah draws Jonah into the presence of God. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is this not what I said? Please take my life, verse 3. It'd be better for me to die than to live. God ordains difficult circumstances to expose disappointment, to draw us into his presence so that our hearts would be engaged by his heart so that we might be changed. Let me tell you something. What you're disappointed in, in the Christian life or with God, is actually not the point. I mean, God cares, truly cares, pities us in our disappointment. But our disappointment's not the point. God wants to go even beyond our disappointment to why are we disappointed. That's the real issue. God cares about our disappointment, but he cares even more about surfacing what's going on inside of us, the idolatry of our hearts that is creating the disappointment to begin with. Now, look, I'm not saying that all disappointment is sin. I'm talking about the kind of disappointment that begins to run our lives. When, when you say, God, take my life, okay, you, you know you've crossed the line, right? But, but even short of that, oftentimes with disappointment, the real issue is some idol, something we're looking to to make life work other than Christ, something we're looking to for satisfaction other than intimacy with Christ. And so God uses and ordains difficulties to surface disappointment so that he could then engage our heart. And notice how God does engage our hearts when we run into his presence. Look at verse 4. God responds, do you do well to be angry? 
God is pursuing Jonah's heart with questions. It reminds me of exactly what happened in Genesis 3 when Adam had sinned. Have you ever noticed the conversation that takes place there? It's, it's pretty amazing. Hey, Adam, where'd you go? <laughs> like God doesn't know. But he's pursuing Adam's heart. Adam says, well, I hid because I was naked. Really? Adam, question two, who told you you were naked? Adam, question three, did you eat of the fruit I told you not to? Did God already know those questions? Of course he did. But God uses circumstances and situations in our lives to create opportunities to build deeper intimacy. Look, think as a parent or a spouse or a friend. You can know they're disappointed. But what happens to your intimacy when they actually share their disappointment with you? It skyrockets. What, what, think of a child that you know is disappointed. What does it mean to you when they come to you at a tender age and share their disappointment with you? There, there's no greater feeling of bonding and closeness and intimacy. Again, it also applies to a friend. It also applies to a spouse, and it applies to God. Do you realize that? Relating to God in His presence is not a whole lot different than relating to a best friend. Please be patient with me on this. Okay, there's a lot of things I don't get. I don't understand this, though. Because I, I think I can relate to this, so I do get it in this sense. How can you not relate to relating to God the way you relate to a best friend? I mean, that's just not that complicated. And yet I'm just shocked that people tend to put God in this different category. Now, is God in a different category than your best friend? Well, in a sense, of course. But in a sense, he's not. If, if you know how to have a conversation with a best friend, you know how to have a conversation with God. If you know how to be authentic with a best friend, you know how to be authentic with God. If you know how to run into the presence of a good friend, you know how to run into the presence of God. If you know how to listen to a good friend, you have the Word of God. This is how he speaks. Run into the presence of God. And if... If, if you need to, especially, not if you need to, that's tongue-in-cheek, run into God's presence with other people because God also speaks through the fellowship. Run or bring your disappointment to God's presence. And then lastly, bring your disappointment to God's pity, bring your disappointment to God's presence, Bring your disappointment to God's providence. Three times in this text, we see the word appoint. Now, appoint is a very strong Hebrew word. It means to ordain. It means to destine. It means to foreordain or to predestine. There's, there's hardly a word that is more... By the way, all these guys leaving, they're not mad at me. They are elders that are getting ready for the Lord's Supper. Okay, so relax. I haven't offended... Well, I've probably offended a bunch of people, but I didn't offend those guys. Well, I may have offended those guys too. Now, bring your disappointment to God's providence. This passage clearly teaches God is absolutely sovereign. Now, you may wrestle with it. That's fine. And you may even struggle with disappointment over that. But let me tell you, if, if you 
refused to believe what God's Word says about His sovereignty, I promise you, you haven't thought through the alternative of God not being sovereign. You hear what I just said? If, if you're troubled, okay, text says God sent a scorching east wind. You know what that says to me? Bob, I sent the tornado. I sent it to your house. Some of you are thinking, oh, I couldn't worship a God like that. Okay, fine. Then what God do you worship? Bob, <laughs> whoops, <laughs> that one got by me. <laughs> that was close, wasn't it, Bob? Do you see what I'm saying? A God who's not sovereign will put you in a rubber room. Because if God's not in control, guess who is? You are. Let that weight come upon your shoulders. If God's not sovereign, then, whoo, man, did you get some bad luck. Oh, wow, that's a doozy. You see what I'm saying? If God's not sovereign, we are sunk. We're going to all be control freaks. We're, we're, we're going to be, we're going to be shriveled up like we're in the womb. When you really, if you don't believe God's sovereign, you've really not thought through what it means to not have God sovereign. Because you wouldn't be here, you'd be in a rubber room. And also, I would think you would be even angrier at all the troubling things that have happened in your life. Because God had nothing to do with it. You don't know whether there's any good that's going to come from it. But if God has appointed a plant and appointed a worm and appointed a scorching east wind, and oh, by the way, the same words used in chapter 1, verse 17, and appointed a giant fish, then God is absolutely in control. And he sends and ordains difficulties, trials, and yes, even tragedies. Because his first concern is his pursuit of our hearts. You see, God is much more concerned about pursuing our hearts than he is about our temporal comfort level. And for some of us, that's just too much. But guess what? I say this kindly and tenderly. God didn't ask our opinion. He's God. We're not. I don't understand. But if I know he's good, and I know he's wise, and I know he's all-powerful, and I know that everything that happens in my life is going to turn out redemptively. God's either going to change me, which is exactly what God has ordained things for in Jonah's life. All God is wanting to do is to show Jonah how much pity God has for him. I mean, what a beautiful thing. And the second thing God's wanting to do is, is to teach Jonah pity so that he would show pity toward others. That's a beautiful thing. I, I, I guess what I'm asking is, what is it worth to you to become like Christ? And maybe the answer to that question is, Bob, that's more than I bargained for. That's more than I signed up for. Well, maybe it is. But guess what? God pursues us even when we realize we signed up for more than we thought we were. God pursues us when everything within us wants to rebel against everything I've said this morning. 
God won't give up. He won't stop pursuing us. By the way, I'll close with this. The plant that God appoints and covers Jonah with shade and soothes him from the heat, I believe it's a symbol of Christ. Only Christ can provide shade from the burning wrath of God. And God appointed Christ to be the only eternal comfort. You see, the the tree, the plant, it was temporary. Christ is the eternal branch, the eternal tree, the eternal vine. And oh, by the way, God appointed a worm, the worm of the cross, to destroy the plant of Christ so that Christ could be raised. How about that for disappointment? That the disciples were disappointed. All they had thought that was true of Christ, they were wrong. But Jesus raised on the third day and has become the eternal shelter of the disappointed. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the book of Jonah. Thank you for pointing us to your pity, to your presence, to your providence. And God, now as we come to the table, might your pity for us be be seen in dramatic form as we partake of the elements. God, might we truly see that we are in your presence at this table and in this room right now. And God, might we trust you with your sovereign providences, that you know what you're doing, that you're not harsh, that you're not mean, that you're not cruel. But God, in fact, you mean what is the very best for us. So you're worthy of our trust. And Father, as Peter said, anyway, where else are we going to go? God, we've got nowhere to go. You're all we have. Help us to actually even relish that this morning. In Jesus' name.